Welcome to Unleash the Potential. We are excited to have Brett Riley, the new coach of LIU, the new D1 program. Um, we're going to talk about how, uh, you know, his playing days. We're going to talk about coaching. We're going to talk about the whole thing. Uh, just honestly, thank you so much for uh, being on with us, Brett. Yeah, glad to be here. Appreciate you having me on here. Yeah, of course. Well, let's just jump right into it. Uh, no need to, to add any more fluff in the, in the mix, right? Um, let's talk a little bit to Thomas a little bit, because uh, overall, I mean, listen, it's, it's awesome. There's a new D1 program uh, in the mix now, the 61, or is it the 61st program in, uh, in, in college hockey now, um, you know, Long Island University, uh, the Sharks, right? So before we get into all that, uh, that fun stuff, let's talk a little bit about, like, tell us a little bit about you, Brett. So, you know, as uh, your playing days, kind of how you came up, you know, uh, great. Just, Awesome. Yeah, no, so I, I was fortunate enough to grow up in a hockey family. I, I grew up in West Point, New York, where my dad uh, was the head coach there uh, following his dad. And now my uncle is currently the head coach at Army. So it runs in the family. Like I said, I was fortunate to grow up and follow him to work and, um, you know, played my hockey at West Point and at Bear Mountain in Ramapo, uh, you know, not too far outside of Long Island. And so uh, I, I loved the game. It took me to play prep school hockey at Governor's Academy in uh, North Shore, Massachusetts. And from there, I was fortunate to play at Hobart, um, a top division three program. You know, while at Hobart, I started coaching in the spring and the summer and kind of caught the bug. And from there, the rest was kind of history. There was no looking back on the coaching side of things. That's awesome. So, uh, you know, growing up in a hockey family, though, so, you know, usually with other people, there's, there's probably, you know, outside coaches. Is there... Um, specific mentorship i mean obviously i'm assuming family is a, is a big part of it like you said sure. growing up. For but sure. is there a you know an outside coach growing up where you know there's experiences that you had a you know a specific team maybe when you were you know 12 14 16 um where you know you were just like i that's a coach i want to be like that's a coach that that you know that's the way my coaching style is you know uh, kind of i want my coaching style to be that way for sure no i think i'm fortunate to learn under a lot of great coaches and you know meet a lot of great people along the way um you know obviously you know, I hate to be cliched here, but following my dad to work and seeing the way he operated and the way the cadets, you know, operated on a daily basis, it was more, you know, not just watching the coaches, but watching the players right. and seeing the pride at Army they took in the culture and, and the importance of every single day, you know, maximizing every minute at a place like Army um, and seeing a place that was run on culture versus strategy. Um, so I took a lot from there. And, and again, along the way, I've been fortunate enough to meet and work with and alongside a lot of great coaches um, from Dave Ryder at Albany Academy, a uh, storied high school coach to Eric Lang, who's done a phenomenal job at AIC. He was at Army before. Um, and then, like I said, you know, too many family members to name from my grandpa uh, to my uncle Brian and anyone in between here. That's awesome. No, it's, it's, you're right. Like it, it's, it's, it's a, it's an interesting dynamic when you just, when it's in your blood, when you're just, just, you know, you're thrown into it, you know, uh, so that's really cool. Um, okay. So now with that, you you know, so I know you kind of transitioned. So after you, you played at Hobart, you, you switched over to, how did you transition to scouting, coaching? So how was that? Like, you know, how, what did you do on, on your final game, right? Your final game, you finally, you, know, you completed your college uh, degree and now, you know, everything's just wide open. Your whole life that you knew before, you know, was over. So like, what happened there? How, how did you make the, you know, how did you make that jump to scouting? For sure. Well, while I was at Hobart, I, I, st I knew I wanted to get into coaching. Uh, my sophomore year, I started a company called Gen 3 Hockey. Um, you know, elite spring and summer teams. And one team turned into two, turned into four, turned into eight. Uh, you know, next thing you know, we had a really successful company of, of awesome kids and, you know, loyal players that we saw summer in and summer out. Um, from there, I had coached several players from Albany Academy, a prep school in, Ob in Albany, New York. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was lucky enough to become a head coach of a prep school. So uh, in my senior year, I kind of knew I would take over the program at Albany Academy. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a natural transition kind of thrown into the fire right away of, of coaching prep school hockey and playing top programs like Avon, Salisbury, and Northwood. Uh, I was extremely fortunate to get to coach those guys at, at such a young age and learn on the go. And just by, you know, success and failures, you know, more failures than success at an early age, for sure. Um, but from there, I spent three great years at Albany Academy. Um, we placed a lot of players in division three and division one college hockey, uh, you know, more so I talked to most of those kids on a daily basis. So it's really cool to see it come, you know, full circle and see many of them playing college hockey now. 
Well, if you don't mind, because I feel like that's like, we always see the successes. We always see all the, the good that comes out, right? That's like the Instagram worthy stuff. Uh, but could you, is there one or two failures that you might want to share that, that could be helpful to, to, you know, just coaches, players, just people out there that like, you know, when you were jumping into the game early, you know, what were, was there a couple of things that you kind of, um, you know, could share that, you know, you learned. I, from I think, yeah. I, I mean, there's so many things, but I think just perspective as a young coach, you get behind the bench and you just think about Friday and Saturday night or in prep school's case, you know, Wednesday and Saturday games, you don't really understand just how important the process is. You know, you hear it all the time, the, the process and uh, maximizing each day, but you just think you show up Wednesday and Saturday and you play your best players and hope for the best. And, right. you know, to some extent that does run true, but you, you know, you forget about how important practices are and the process and, um, you know, keeping perspective too. When we got to Albany Academy, it was six or seven wins the, the year before. So you have to, you know, keep perspective on the build and that it's a process versus, instant results. And I think as a younger coach, a lot of times you hope for, you snap your finger and everything gets better. But, um, you know, we took our beatings in the first year, but we also upset, you know, programs like Salisbury at Salisbury and Thayer Academy. And, um, you know, we learned to celebrate those small victories. And um, I, I look back and just realize the value of relationships too, because as a younger coach, you become very tight with the guys. And I learned quickly that if I gave everything to them, they would do the same. So I, I was fortunate to coach a great group of, of kids. And like I said, I still connect with most of those guys day in and day out. That's awesome. Yeah, that's, uh, I think that that's one of the hardest parts. I, I know you mentioned, um, I know you mentioned uh, culture as being a, an important piece there. So is that something that kind of just, again, you kind of, like you said, you've kind of seen it for a long time, but how did you, how has culture been different for you, you know, now compared to, you know, your first uh, couple coaching gigs? Um, yeah, I, I think culture is a, a word that people throw around and you hear it left and right, but you have to live it 24-7. Um, and that's one thing I, I strive to do as a younger coach is to have the guys see me at the office first, leaving last, you know, uh, no task above us. So, you know, for my end, picking up pucks from their end, the captains better pick up the pucks right. versus the freshmen. And, and just creating a, you know, ultra hockey passionate culture where the guys see the passion from the coaching staff and the leaders and the captains. And that we care about every guy from top of the roster to bottom of the roster, the eighth graders, the freshmen. Um, and a lot of times at a prep school environment or a college environment, um, the culture being if you're squared away off the ice, you're squared away on the ice. So not overlooking uh, the emphasis of GPA or getting to class or being early or looking presentable. Um, for us as a new program at LIU, we think that's going to be a huge advantage is our culture advantage. The fact that as a first year head coach of the program, I can help shape the culture. And that was the great thing. Uh, I was fortunate enough to coach at Wilkes University and start the program there, a Division Three program. That was the best thing um, about starting there is the guys didn't know any other culture other than maybe their junior or their prep school. So, you know, basically saying this is how college hockey is done and doing it to our standard and our brand um, versus previous stops. Again, it's oftentimes easier said than done because it's a daily battle. It's 24-7, 365 day mission. Um, but never losing sight of how important culture is over the strategy piece. Right. Well, it's interesting you mentioned Wilkes because that was actually, uh, you know, on, on my list of things that I kind of wanted to touch with you is uh, it's, it's – so the nice thing is that this isn't your first time starting a program. You actually started there. Um, you know, what are some of the – and, I, again, I, I realize that some of the things you, you may not be able to share. So if you could just kind of overall uh, in any way, or if you can't, obviously, no worries – but uh, what are some of the things that you're kind of, you know, that you learned from starting the program at Wilkes, right? That now you'd like to add into the program now to, uh, you know, to make sure that you guys are successful and you guys are going to crush it uh, come, you know, the season coming up, hopefully, obviously with COVID and all that kind of thing. But um, yeah, I, I learned a lot. It was a little bit different in the sense that we had, you know, one year to recruit at Wilkes versus the three or four months. <laughs> right. Um, you know, then again, Division Three, the recruiting process can be a lot longer as you wait through the trickle-down effect and things like that. But um, I I've learned this time, you know, to roll with the punches a little bit. You know, there's going to be some hiccups and road bump, uh, roadblocks along the way, whether it's, you know, delayed jersey ordering or, say, mm -hmm. locker room construction. And, you know, to control what you can to maximize every day. But with Wilkes, I just learned the importance of um, showing the players how much you are invested because – out of the gate, you may not have the materialistic goods of, you know, established programs, but to, you know, pay it back in terms of hours given to the players and also to set the bar 
um, high. You know, I, I think we were picked for ninth place that year out of 10 teams and uh, going into the last weekend almost won the league outright. And I think, you know, we set a standard that we were, uh, you know, not that new program mentality, but something to prove mentality. And we were a hungry team with a chip on our shoulders, you know, led by the coaches uh, at, at some time. But I think um, what I learned is just to set the bar high. Because if you set the bar as, hey, we're here and, you know, it will get there, um, it may never get there. By the same token, to keep perspective. You know, there was times where we were frustrated out of the gate and um, to keep perspective on what we had to do to get to where we needed to be. Um, and I guess the last thing I'll add is just how important having the right people are. Uh, the players at Wilkes, you know, the guys that are still there, they're unbelievable kids. And we tried to recruit the kids that said, wow, I can build a new program, not um, necessarily new program. I have a chance to play and be the guy. And uh, I'm so proud of what the guys are doing there right now. Uh, you know, they were ranked as high as ninth this year in division three in their second mm -hmm. year. And that's, you know, a lot of people would look back and credit myself for Tyler Hines, who's done a fantastic job, the head coach there now. But a lot of the credit, if not all, is to the players that have built that place. They've done a fantastic job taking the leap of faith uh, on a new program and, and young coaches. Yeah, I, that's, that's, that's interesting because it's, uh, you know, like, like we talked about, it's a, like the culture of it's so important and, and how all that all comes together. Um, what I wanted to uh, – so the next part I kind of wanted to touch with you is, uh, you know, you so we kind of talked about you being a head coach now the one time you were uh, assistant coaches actually last year right uh with Colgate um how is that different you know being a head coach like the job of the head For coach sure. to the job of the assistant coach and it, it was totally different just in the sense you know you're going from division three and a new program to division one and an established program from a head coach to an assistant coach um but very fortunate um, to work and learn under Coach Don Vaughn, who's obviously been doing it for a long time here and has such an amazing track record of not only developing really good hockey players, but good people. Mm -hmm. uh, Colgate is an amazing place and um, academically, athletically, to the rink, uh, you know, class of 65 arena um, and so much to sell there. And so it was a fantastic year spent there. I think the program made great strides on the ice culturally and it was impressive to see just the standard that was already set of how these guys operate off the ice and um, what great people the players were. And um, it was a fantastic year. Um, and I'm very fortunate for the opportunity uh, that has now led me to be at LIU. Yeah, no, that, that's, well, so that's the interesting part. I feel like, uh, you know, in every walk of life um, until, you know, the, the saying, you know, uh, don't judge a person until you walk a mile in their shoes. You know, uh, I think for I sure. said that right. Um, so, you know, being now, you know, going, getting some time at the assistant position, kind of seeing the different things, how does it, did it change your view of how to work with, you know, your coaching staff, like the guys that you're going to, or, you know, the, the guys or girls that you're going to have that as your coaches, right, or on your coaching staff, um, did it give you a different perspective maybe of how you could, you know, what way you should or shouldn't or anything along the lines of that? Yeah, I think, I think perspective is everything, too. It was good to see it from a different vantage point. Um, you know, when you're a head coach, a lot of times you have a lot of stresses that maybe the assistants don't see or tasks uh, that they don't realize or take for granted. And, um, you know, being on the other side of it, like I said, Coach Vaughn has been doing it for a long time and um, has really good just perspective in general of, of life beyond hockey. And so that's, I, I think, the biggest thing I'll take with me is just, uh, you know, the well-being and the assistant coaches knowing that they're, you know, grinding 24 um, seven, you know, sort of continue to lead from the front, but also understand where they're coming from and the time and effort they're putting into the build um, of our program. That's one thing that, you know, I learned while being at Wilkes too, is when starting a program, it takes a village and that it's going to be all hands on deck here. So um, it, it was great to spend a year as an assistant coach and see it from a different angle. Um, you learn how to operate within a staff and that, you know, your decision or your call is not the final call. Um, but input, input, you know, for the betterment of the cause. And um, I think working with our assistants, um, you know, have not been named yet. That will be a great opportunity for me, um, you know, to give them equity and in, in tasks, but also, um, you know, gain the perspective of we're doing this to build something a lot bigger than ourselves, uh, right. bigger than just the coaching staff. Yeah, no, that, that's, uh, that's great. That's well, that's now, I guess, kind of moving forward now that we're kind of getting into the, the Sharks, uh, present time Sharks. Um, 
you mentioned this a little earlier, you know, you only had a little bit of time to, or not a little bit of time, but you, you don't have that much time right now to, to do other recruiting. There's so much work that's, that's, that's on your plate at the moment. Um, so, you know, with Corona, <laughs> um, you know, the, how much, cause again, like you said with Wilkes, it was different cause you also had a year, right? Uh, yep. here now yep. you're talking, we're talking about less time. And at the, on top of that, we have an epidemic plus everything else that's going on in the world. Um, uh, you know, I don't know if you saw the, the Savannah, uh, the dust that's supposed to come across the, the, the whole thing. Yep. Uh, so it's just right now, it's just a, it's just a very um, 2020 has just been a very interesting year so far. So, you know, how has that uh, affected you? How, you know, how, um, how are you kind of move forward uh, through that? And, and, and you know, I'm not sure if I'm pushing you the right way there. No, no, that's, that's great. I think, like I said, last time, there's always going to be roadblocks and hurdles and obstacles and different variables. And uh, what I am hoping I'm doing a better job of this time around is just keeping perspective on the build. And, um, you know, there's a lot of things going on in the world right now. Um, and hopefully, you know, the building of this program can be something positive, um, to lift people up, you know, more opportunities for kids to play division one hockey and exciting, um, you know, program coming to long Island and, um, just learning, you know, doing what I can to control what I can. And it's uh, interesting to try and build a, a team when you can't be in the rink. Um, but those are the circumstances we're dealt and, um, you know, we're going to go after it, you know, for us, we are, uh, sifting through who are the right kids to build this program. Uh, I'm fortunate that there's a lot of great players out there that want to play division one hockey and are capable, right. you know, now it's time to decipher who wants to play it. Cause it may be their last stop or the other 60 programs passed over them or, um, you know, who are the guys that see the value of building something and what a tremendous opportunity it can be. And ultimately, those are the people we want in our program, um, the young men that see the bigger picture versus just four years division one for themselves. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, and I think that's one of the hardest parts is when you're playing junior hockey, it seems like it's just like a, like a meat market, like just things are being, like guys are being moved all the time. And there's just, you know, like I know a couple, a couple of the guys that I, that I know that just, you know, they, they went to like three different teams in one year, um, you know, and it, it I think it's, it's tough to be in a locker room where you're not sure if you're going to be there any longer or how long you're going to be there. Um, so it's nice where when you go right to, to the division one program, you're actually looking at staying there and hopefully you're not just looking out for yourself and the next step that way, but you're also looking out for the team. And um, is it, do you have a trick or the trade of how to, how to, you know, decipher, you know, and, and kind of get a better idea of like, I, this is a guy that's going to hit the right mark and compared to this guy. I don't think there's any trick. I think it's trusting your gut and intuition um, for me, one thing I've taken from my dad in terms of the scouting side, he's worked with the Blue Jackets and now the Sabres, is the importance of due diligence in your scouting. Um, so making calls to maybe not just the current coach, but the high school coach uh, or the youth coach or um, whoever it may be to make sure we have proper homework and we're not dealt any surprises. Granted, you know, we might not uh, hit the 100% mark, but we're going to do everything in our power so when our student athletes come through the door, we feel like we know them inside and out. And from then it's on us to mold them and cultivate the culture um, and build them up as young men. We have targeted and a lot of captains in the recruiting process. Um, you know, that's a big thing for me, players that come from winning environments, players that have led um, or players that have won a championship. Um, but also maybe, you know, players that were top players on a struggling team that just need an opportunity to prove what they can do that may be overlooked because of the team or the nature of their situation. So in short, there's no magic recipe. I think it's just doing homework and then trusting, you know, your gut and your recruiting conversations. You know, I've had hundreds of calls with kids now and, you know, I think you only really remember the top 5% and the bottom 5%. Right. Um, and, you know, there have been some very impressive kids that I've gotten off the phone and said, you know, we need them in our program. They understand what we're trying to build. Um, and like I said, we're not going to pass over on, you know, the very high character kids here. Yeah, that's, well, that, that's the, that's the interesting part there. You have, um, I, I think, it, it, so I guess with that though, is there, um, what do you do with a guy that's been a captain, right? You, you, like you said, like you wanted leaders and that kind of thing. How, how do you mold that situation where there's a bunch of guys that were always captains, were always yeah. like the, the, the top question. dog. How do, how, do you, you know, how do you mow those guys together? Great question. It's something we encountered at Wilkes. Uh, we had 30 kids come in and 
I think 70% of them, a little over 20 guys or so were captains. And so <laughs> now they're back to the ground floor and, um, it, you know, there is a little bit of a power struggle and, you know, guys jockeying for it. And we actually ironically didn't have captains that year. And it was the best thing we could have done in terms of a leadership perspective. Um, so I think it's knowing that and, you know, not having a preconceived notion of what we want to do. You know, some coaches will say we're going to have one C, two A's or however the breakdown of captains, maybe we'll have none, maybe they'll rotate, you know, maybe we'll look at each other on day one and say, that's our guy. Um, right. So just, you know, understanding that these guys have all been leaders of their teams and now they're going to be thrown back into, um, you know, day one in a new beginning. Um, and that's an exciting thing. You know, at Wilkes, like I said, we had a bunch of captains and in the preseason we saw uh, one morning in front of our office, kind of a little power struggle of an argument. And um, they thought it was controversy. And my assistant, Tyler Hines, and I said, I think we're finally getting somewhere. With these right. guys. But they, <laughs> they see that they're all back to the beginning. So uh, that's a really good question. I don't think I have an exact answer for, for you now, but I think it will be fun to watch and monitor. And, you know, we do have hopefully a few transfers coming in uh, that can bounce the classes. And um, we'll let it play out naturally. Um, but I'm very confident in the character of guys that will be coming in, I believe. That's awesome. That's great. Um, okay. So I guess kind of coming, you know, coming to the end of the, the, the overall questions that I kind of really wanted to hit you with. Um, so, so as a coach, I mean, I, I, we kind of touched on a lot of this stuff. Um, do you, you know, we kind of touched on, you know, what your expectations as a coach are. Um, you know, it seems like it's like your, your, uh, your ability to, to, to create the situation where the guys are going to thrive, they're going to crush it. Um, but do you have a specific type? Like, would you say you're a specific type of coach, players coach, would you, uh, you know, what, what would you, uh, what would you say you're more in the category if you would even categorize yourself? Um, I would say that I, you know, hopefully can be a master motivator and a cultivator of uh, creating a winning culture. For me, I want the guys to enjoy every single day they're at the rink, but also see the value of being on campus and the education. Um, and not forget to have fun when they're in the locker room and laugh and enjoy the experience. But when they're on the ice, it's to create the most competitive culture possible so that guys can different, differentiate, you know, um, locker room time to rink time to video time. Um, and so I think if there's one thing, hopefully people can expect to see from us on Friday and Saturday nights, it's a team that won't back down. It's a team that will take pride in winning puck battles and blocking shots. And we want to be the most competitive team. Um, you know, we might not have all five-star recruits coming in and, uh, you know, players may have different deficiencies and that's okay. Um, but one thing, you know, we won't shy away from is being the most competitive team in college hockey. And we won't stop until we get to the top of that list. That's awesome. No, that's great. That's, I, I think that's what it could, because, you know, I feel like sometimes you, I mean, obviously you, you want to have some kind of understanding of uh, who you are and that kind of thing. But what it comes down to it is being able to, to, to shift and move with, with the situation that you're in. Right. It's sure. uh, <laughs> um, cool. And then, I mean, I guess uh, any advice to the players coming through, um, you know, to, to you, so not just, I mean, for the guys that would want to play for you. Right. But also just in general, is there something that, you know, you would, uh, the guys should take home with them and to really focus in on whether they're four years away of, you know, playing, uh, college hockey or they're six years or they're, you know, this is their last year in juniors and they're, they're, they're you know, about to jump into the mix. I, I would say just kind of going back to that, you know, hundreds of calls, hundreds of emails is just be diff do be something that's going to differentiate yourself. Um, you know, why are you a good fit for the program and what will you bring? Um, you know, like for instance, you know, one young man just talked about his ability to block more shots that he would, you know, and then send clips of it. And so I think it's just important for guys to give something that will make them jump off the page and, and live to that. Um, but also, you know, present yourself in the best way in, in not just the hockey category in terms of academic school, family, um, whatever it may be. Cause uh, I, as I remind myself, you know, we're not just building a hockey team. We're building a program that strives to be successful in the classroom, in the community and on the ice. And if guys are just focused on the hockey piece or, you know, the allure of division one hockey, then it's probably not going to be a very good fit for them um, because we want guys that are well-rounded. And like I said, our most squared away guys on the ice are probably going to be the same off the ice. And so um, to see the full picture uh, of LIU hockey, uh, the players, the coaches, the school, um, and, and what we can do in a short period of time. Okay. Now, and then with that, I mean, 
What, uh, I, I, again, I understand that it's not necessarily in your control, um, but is, do you have an idea? Because I think I, I, I was looking at some different things, and um, you guys are looking at doing like 20 games this season? Um, I think we'll be above that mark. Um, you know, the contracts still need to be signed, and obviously so much is up in the air right now um, with scheduling, but I think when we roll out our schedule, that's going to be a statement. Um, again, we're not going to shy away from playing the top teams. Granted, it will be a little bit of a, you know, traveling show being on the road a lot this year. And that's something that we want guys, like I said, that will roll with the punches. And if they were, you know, heading up to Boston or to Midwest, you know, let's do it. Um, and so people will be surprised at the ambitious schedule that we're putting together. Um, and again, that's the way we want to do it. We don't want to take a backseat to anyone and you have to start somewhere. So why not, you know, aim for the top and learn and, um, you know, keep value on the process while we're at it. 100%. Okay. Uh, and that's, so that, and that's the thing to, so, uh, you know, again, realizing that there's a lot of things that are unknown at the moment, but, um, are there things that, you know, uh, like with the season, is there new things that maybe you could share with, uh, you know, the, the people that are listed and, um, what would, you know, with, with all the things kind of going on with Corona and that kind of thing, uh, how is, you know, how is the season like looking, is, is there like a plan A, B, C, is there. I, I think that. you're going to, you're going to hear a lot and see a lot. And I don't think that anyone truly knows um, right now. So your guests would be as good as mine. We are going to, you know, prepare as though we're playing college hockey um, Saturday night on October 4th or October 5th um, and, and take it from there. And, you know, if we hear otherwise, again, we'll roll with the punches and uh, make sure our guys are safe. That's the priority in their families right now. Um, but hopefully we can give people something to be excited about when college hockey starts back up again. So it's an exciting time. Um, you know, it's also a nerve wracking time and, um, you know, we're going to do our best to just keep perspective and take it day by day here. Okay. That's great. Um, well, listen, I, I, Brad, thank you so much for jumping on. I, I appreciate, you know, you telling us about you a little bit and, um, and now with, with the sharks, is there anything you'd like to, to touch base on with that? Is there anything you'd like to put out, um, you know, for us, the, the, the majority of people that listen are, are hockey players, parents, uh, organization, like, you know, people and, and, and coaches. So is there any, uh, is there anything that you'd like to put out there? Is there anything, any kind of information that, you know, you'd like us to share or, or any of that kind of thing? Um, not too much. I just, I just think it's a really exciting time and um, I hope people will follow us and, you know, take an interest in us in, in terms of building a program. And I, like I said, I think when we roll out our recruiting class, at our schedule, I think people will know we're for real. So, um, you know, we have kind of that something to prove mentality versus new program mentality. And we're excited to take on, um, you know, the ranks of division one hockey in no better place than the metropolitan area in, in Long Island. So we are, we're pumped up to get this thing going here. Yeah, that's great. Brett, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, again, good luck to you. Uh, I'll be up in that area, so I'm, I'm definitely going to come visit you uh, during the season. Well, again, depending right. on the situation, I'm definitely going to come visit you guys. Uh, but, yeah, again, thank you so much for jumping on with us. Yeah, really appreciate you having me on here.